Thank you so much for having me. It's it's a real honor to be here and also humbling to follow the previous speaker. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, so I'm from New York City and through my membership in open science communities, I get to work with environmental activists doing local research all over the world. And just to, just to get grounded, um, you know, in this summit, we've spoken a lot about publishing open data, publishing data the government has on its citizens, and in turn, about citizens collecting data on the government. And I want to ask, who collects data on the government? similar to the prior speaker. <clears throat> the analogy I'd like to make is if you like chasing down government corruption, then maybe you can relate to environmentalism as chasing down pollution. Global climate change is a large topic that's hard to get a hold of. But if you look around and you see oil extraction and oil refineries in your backyard, you can start there. Um, this talk focuses on three ideas, open source hardware, for local and small data collection, and the use of that data for advocacy, which means working towards your locally held goals. Open data is essential for better citizen government collaboration. But what about when there's no data? Although we're in an age of big data with satellites orbiting and observing the Earth. Very little of that is useful information for at a high enough spatial resolution for knowing what's in the soil behind your house where your kids are playing. Um, uh, for us here at the summit, I want to speak to you and say that if you think politics moves too slow to effectively address the important issues facing us today, then unfortunately I have to tell you that science, institutional science, moves even slower. Scientists who, much, who must seek tenure and publish papers, they have to do groundbreaking research. Groundbreaking. They cannot, they will not study the broken ground of environmental pollution. <clears throat> so there is an urgent need for research on environmental pollution that's affecting people's health. It's not being done by institutional science and it needs citizen action. I'd like to present three example projects. Um, I helped start two of them. Uh, which is Tree Kit and Public Lab. But because of a very uh, big win, a big achievement in the United States in the last year, I also want to tell you a story of a project that I had nothing to do with, which is the Western New York Clean Air Coalition. So, 
Tree Kit started as an independent citizen project, but grew and is now an ongoing citizen government collaboration. It's about urban forests, which have a big impact on air quality. <clears throat> Neighbors have worked for a long time to take care of their own trees as a as the most direct way to improve environmental quality. People like Miss Eva drew maps of where the trees were by hand and kept records in notebooks of how she took care of them. This has been going on for decades in New York. And, but in the last 10 years, <clears throat> you know, so, so that's a bottom-up example. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've had a billionaire mayor who had a top-down idea to plant a million trees. <clears throat> um, people like Eva uh, were not able to use government data in the past because if you see at the top, those green dots are where the government thought the trees were is on top of the buildings or in the middle of the road. The Simple Tree Kit project produces accurate data with the location of trees and the size of soil they grow in. And we did it using very simple tools, very old-fashioned. A wheel that records distances um, we get much higher accuracy than GPS by simply walking down the block from tree to tree. Going neighborhood by neighborhood, over four years, we mapped 12,000 trees in New York. And that was our field test. Last year, the New York City government the Parks Department, who has jurisdiction over the street trees, decided they needed the same good quality data so that someone could stand under a tree and look at a map and know which one it was. And so uh, the government gathered money, partnered with a great software company, and scaled the tree kit method up into a mobile website. <clears throat> Tree Kids stayed involved to make sure that it was, it was a learning experience for the people doing the mapping. It's not just a crowdsourcing project um, because the long-term goal was to create stewards, people who take care of the trees. And I can report that in 2015, Thousands of people mapped over half a million trees in New York. And there's already a beta map displaying this tree data, as well as the activities carried out by the government to keep them healthy, and activities carried out by the neighbors to keep them healthy. So this is a happy story of citizen government collaboration. <laughs> Now, this next example is totally different, and I'm going to tell the short version in three slides. Again, I had nothing to do with this project. But in a neighborhood near Niagara Falls um, called Tonawanda, people were getting sick, and they began to suspect that the coal refinery named Tonawanda coal was releasing chemicals into the air. The woman in red, her name is Jackie Creedon. She was sick. She reached out to an organization named Global Community Monitor. Global Community Monitor. Who had developed a bucket 
for collecting air samples. It's a simple plastic bucket containing a sterile laboratory bag inside. Using a house vacuum, you can remove the air from the inside of the bucket, causing the bag to open, pulling in an air sample. <clears throat> that air sample was sent to the state environmental agency, who were shocked. 75 times the amount of benzene. The state agency went to the federal agency. They, they put official monitors for a whole year. And then they called the Department of Justice. And this is the press release. Um, Tanawanda Koch was convicted in 2013. And just now, in December 2015, just five months ago, they lost their final appeal. The company is facing $30 million US in fines. 11 million US is going to study the health effects of this pollution. And 12 million just is a fine. <laughs> I really want to tell you this story, and I hope you go and look it up, because at least in the United States, it's the second biggest victory ever under our federal air quality law. And it started with citizen data collection using open source hardware. This is my last example, Public Lab. Um, it's a group I helped start to make environmental research something anyone can do well. Um, raise your hand if you went to the balloon mapping this morning. Anyone? OK, only a few. Ah, I did not bring the balloon equipment, but it shows that um, with a cheap camera and a long string and either a big kite or a lot of balloons, you can get your own aerial imagery. And we wrote some simple software for turning those photographs into maps that get exported into standard data formats used by government, science, and industry. In this way, citizens can speak languages of power instead of just complaining. I should update my map of maps, because there are many more now that have been made. <clears throat> um, but for any open street map enthusiasts, there's a one-click connection to bring your aerial photographs into OpenStreetMap for tracing. This particular photograph cost a polluting coal company $75,000 US. And it could not have been captured by a satellite. The legal definition at play is that pollution was ongoing. Ongoing, like still happening. And if you look under the dock, you can see a pointy coal pile. So pointy that if it had been from last week or last month, the pile would have become flat. But a kite flat, taking a photograph at a low angle captured this, and this served as evidence in court and held the company accountable. <clears throat> um, in Public Lab, there's a large global open source community, um, people with many kinds of expertise who will respond to a resident who reaches out and says, I have pollution. I need to know how to collect data. And I need to know how to use that data to actually get this cleaned up. <clears throat> so we're a combination of um, grassroots organizing and movement building, plus being a regular online community. 
As we move into not only taking pictures of oil, but taking physical samples, um, we moved into another development project. This is an example of taking advantage of simple principles to extend what we can sense about our environment. It, a simple observation well known in science is that oil fluoresces under ultraviolet light. And different oils fluoresce differently. So we wanted to start empirically testing uh, oil identification. And we began building um, simple equipment to hold the laser. We folded something out of paper. <clears throat> and we made a spectrometer to control the way that light hits a camera. And because we're open source, each time uh, someone in the community made an improvement, we printed the link to their research right on the physical box. So this is moving massive attribution into the physical world. Now there's something called an oil testing kit where samples, the same samples of oil are sent out to people around the world who replicate the test. We're testing two things. We're testing the equipment that we have ourselves built and we're testing the ability of the equipment to identify oils. We're experimenting with science at scale and learning how to differentiate different types of oil by its fingerprint. The workshop I held here two years ago, um, we only got as far as building a spectrometer, but since then, and inspired by Taiwan's interest in food quality, um, other people around the world, um, in Turkey and in Boston, have tested, can diluted percentages of oil, of olive oil, be identified. And you can see in this graph that they can. For in order from blue, red, purple, green, you can s decreasing amounts of olive oil, you can see the decreasing response in the spectral graph. And it would be exciting for more people to replicate this and continue learning more about food quality. And many other people are focused on identifying oil in the environment, um, such as this picture from earlier in January of gutter oil, of suspected gutter oil being made um, in China. <clears throat> and so this is the last part of my talk. It should be more fun <laughs> um, about just a couple things that are happening over here. Um, we are a worldwide community, but we are definitely Western Hemisphere dominated, English and Spanish primarily, uh, Portuguese also. Um, but very, very recently, some Chinese. Um, this morning we had fun taking aerial balloon photographs of ourselves um, outside. But also Gavin, who's here, is Gavin here in this room? Gavin, <laughs> would you like to say anything about this photo? You don't have to. OK. Um, um, I am very impressed by Gavin. I want to stay in touch because I have learned that uh, he flies drones over the ocean to identify oil spills and chemical spills. And he did that this morning. Can you see the iridescent um, crescent of oil there? Yeah, this is from just this morning on Taiwan's own beach. Two years ago, Muya took an aerial photo of the 2014 gas explosion here in Taipei and geo-referenced it in MapNitter. And in January this year, 2016, I traveled with Shan and a group of, and, and an engineer, a designer, 
and photojournalist to explore polluted water that was adjacent to a pharmaceutical factory. Nearby, we experimented with kites, flying kites until late in the day. And then, based on the wind conditions being too slow, we made a choice to come back with balloons and helium. We attached the small camera to the balloon, just as we did this morning, and released the string so that they could fly high into the sky. You can see them just above and to the right of the smokestack. And they began to see what we could not see. The aerial photograph showed us the area of water pollution uh, where the fishermen reported fish kills. That's the green water on the left. We also began to understand the factory had some kind of liquid storage, black liquid, just on the other side of that wall, and there was a pipe where the water was being released. As the balloon flew higher, we saw an unused water treatment plant. You see the three rectangular water pools that are overgrown. They are not working, which means the water is not being cleaned. The balloons continued to rise and capture images of the entire factory and show the setting in the beautiful Guilin Mountains. Of course, we also took pictures of ourselves. <clears throat> but more importantly, these pictures are now in the hands of environmentally concerned citizens who will use it to develop their own clean water advocacy campaign with the fishermen. Um, my last two slides, <laughs> exciting. Um, I wanted to invite you to continue this conversation about what scientific data is also legal evidence. What is proof in science? What is proof in law? And um, we're going to have a Google Hangout on June 6. It'll be recorded because the time is not appropriate for us here. It's going to be in the middle of the night, one, one in the morning. Um, but it will be recorded. And, we would, and if, in case you're a night owl, we would love to have you join us. Check out publiclab.org slash open hour. And um, I wanted to invite everyone to visit publiclab.org. There's a lot of information that might be helpful. And maybe you would like to ask a question. Um, there's a lot of people who would be excited to hear from you. We have many mailing lists. And specifically, this QR code is for WeChat, where there's about 50 people um, uh, conversing in Chinese. And I like WeChat because I can translate back and forth. So I talk in there, too. Um, thank you so much for listening. I'd love to hear any questions you have. Thank you for asking this tough question. 
So the projects I've presented were five years, six years, eight years in the making before I could tell these stories. It's very new that we have these results. <clears throat> and this exact question that you ask is what we're going to talk about in this open hour. Um, essentially, only physical air samples analyzed by certified labs and photographs have held any weight in the United States legal system. That's a good thing about the kind of mapping we do. Our maps are made of photos and our software preserves the original photos. Uh, so even if we make maps, we tend to submit individual photos to court. In this conversation we're having, um, we're going to have someone who's working with an Internet of Things approach, sensor data, trying to hold landlords accountable for not providing enough heat. So this is, um, so we're going to have one person working with sensor data at a municipal level court. We're going to have, um, we're actually having Jack, we're actually having both of the other examples I showed the coal pile, the coal pile from Scott, and the bucket from Jackie. Both Scott and Jackie are going to be coming on to talk about physical air samples at the federal level and photographic, level, photographic data at the state level. And we're also having environmental lawyers join us to explain that you could be, you could have a PhD from every university in the world but if the argument isn't there of what, you're, if what the lawyers can say about the data, then, as you said, the scientists will be thrown out. So <clears throat> we're, we're in a gray area, and this is why I called for citizen action and environmental research, because institutional science can't figure out the law. But citizens advocating for locally held goals and holding companies accountable, that is typical for being handled in court. So I, I really hope you, you join us because we're, there's a large number of people trying to figure this out right now. Hi, uh, it's, it's really nice to listen to your speech and I appreciate it very much for your sharing. And as you mentioned that in the final part, coming with the Chinese local uh, activists, I, I, know, uh, uh, I know that actually uh, I have thorough experience working in China and cover with local communities there, and I found that it's hard to persuade local community to provoke local uh, citizens to participate, because uh, maybe for its, it's also sensitive for Chinese government to manage this kind of thing. As you have mentioned that especially for environmental issues, sometimes it concerns with the, maybe the profit between the industry and the government themselves. So uh, according to your personal experience so far, uh, even you have a WeChat account in China. <laughs> so so uh, how do you think to cover with the local activists there and which kind of uh, community you are communicating with there? Can you give us a, a big introduction about that? Um, I've had the, the great uh, privilege of meeting some incredible environmental activists in China. And I am making myself available to transfer any knowledge that they think would be useful. There are not solutions from the West for the problems facing people in China. But we can be a worldwide community and maybe with their insight and local expertise uh, of the Chinese environmentalists with their own insight and local expertise, they can look around and see maybe something that has been tried somewhere else could be useful here. So I think that's the real benefit of working together in an online community is that we can, sh that knowledge can move faster. But truly no one else has a solution for someone in another place. All of the you can see, this is why the logo of Public Lab is a pair of boots. 
because it's your boots where you're standing. Stand for what you stand on, and only the, their, the situation of people and what they want to have happen can direct the research and all the, the work towards applying the data. Um, no one else can do that for anyone. Even me in New York, I can't do it for Boston. Yes, very much. I'll take your second question first. Um, there are many institutional scientists working in public lab, and they make a huge contribution. We couldn't do it without them. It's very important to have institutional scientists involved. Um, just as technologists and community organizers each have their specialties, um, Institutional scientists have been generous in lending their expertise to help residents design their research projects and to help them understand the data, to understand the shortcomings of tools, what we should look out for when we try to do things for cheaper. Um, it's, it's really invaluable. <clears throat> um, we, I can also say that citizen, there's a term, citizen science, because I do this all the time, I have a very detailed definition of that, at least from the West. Citizen science has become a type of participation in science where an institutional scientist asks a question and everyone else goes and collects data towards answering that question. And this structure has brought about great advances to science capital S science, and I am in support of it, but it is not what Public Lab is doing. In Public Lab, you ask your own question, and then people with multiple ki and kinds of expertise contribute, and, and, you, and you, ask, you ask for help. And, and that's, that's why you know, a, being a diverse community is helping people do their own environmental research better. About working with government, I can say, not very much because I, all of these projects are with many collaborators. And it would be my more patient collaborators that work most closely with institutions. I would not be the one going to government meetings. <laughs> but that's why it's good to have partners. <laughs> Uh, if anyone has other questions, welcome to direct to uh, Liz. Uh, let me thank Liz, Liz presentation.